morning, church. All right, good to see many of you back for the first time. Uh, welcome back. Things might look a little different with tape on the uh, pews, but we're glad you're here. And uh, if you're watching online, we're glad you're joining us this morning as well. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 6. We're going to kind of continue through the Gospel of Mark. That's where we've been for several months now. And uh, we're kind of jumping in. I just want to go ahead and address something. I've noticed something on social media. Uh, I've noticed that some of you are brave souls, and you've ventured out, and you've gone on vacation, and I'm living vicariously through your pictures on Facebook of uh, you at the beach, and you don't look like you have any mask, uh, you know, tan lines or anything like that, so you look like you're doing well. Uh, you know, before this whole COVID thing happened, I actually went on vacation, went on vacation for spring break, and actually that's when everything kind of just, you know, the whole nation kind of imploded while I was gone. Step back onto U.S. soil and realize that there's no NBA, there's no Major League Baseball, uh, everything's shut down, schools are closed, and people were calling our phone and they were saying, hey, before you come back, make sure to buy toilet paper. And I was like, no, that's ridiculous. That's the most ridiculous thing that I've heard. And when we got back, there was no toilet paper. So we had to have those talks about how many plies you really need, you know, when you use it. That might be too much information, but I, I'm telling you all this because uh, I have no idea why I'm telling you all this, to be honest with you, uh, but that was a good intro. So uh, as we get into scripture this morning, we're seeing a, a, a section of scripture that uh, is very memorable. Most people know this section of scripture. They've heard this story, and they were told this story as a kid, or even if they didn't grow up in church, they kind of they heard about this, and it's Jesus walking on water. And what's really interesting about this story is that it's raised a lot of skepticism. A lot of people just, they just can't wrap their minds around this fact. Now, when we were on our vacation, now I remember, like it went full circle. I remember while I was telling you that story. When we were on vacation, we were on a cruise, and this, this magic man walked up to our dinner table. And he did all these little magic tricks, and we were like, oh, it's so good, it's so good. And, uh, you know, but we could see that they were, they were gimmicks. They were tricks. And, you know, some of them we noticed were, you know, not real, and we are like, oh, we saw how you did that. And then other ones we were like, that was crazy. How did he do that? But we knew it was just a magic trick. And here's, here's the deal. When we talk about Jesus walking on water, there's a lot of people who think it was a magic trick. A lot of skeptics out there, they think that the miracles of Jesus were just magic tricks, but they, they weren't. They weren't mere magic tricks. They, they showed his glory. They showed that he was the Messiah. So these skeptics, this is what they'll say about this story. They'll say it was an illusion caused by Jesus walking along the shore. Well, he was just kind of walking along the shore, and if you just look just right, it looked like he was walking on the water. Or they'll say it was deception caused by him walking on a sandbar. Look how far out the sandbar is. Maybe you've been that person, you've swam out to the sandbar, and your parents were like, no, they're sharks, don't, come back. So this is what people say. They think that it might be an illusion or a deception. But this is a defining miracle for establishing Jesus' divinity. I mean, because if you think about this, I mean, there's, there's people getting healed. There's demons being cast out. There's all kinds of these other miracles that they're witnessing, but it's really hard to explain Jesus walking on water because magic men can't actually walk on water and they don't rise from the dead. But God can do both. And so as we get into this very familiar section of scripture, you, you've got to realize, let me back up a little bit for y'all, right? So you've got to realize that this is not just some made-up story. This is not some myth of legend. Even Peter, whose account we're, we're looking at in the Gospel of Mark. Peter would say this in 2 Peter 1.16, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths. These weren't just myths. These weren't just stories that were made up when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. Peter's like, look, these stories I'm telling you, these weren't magic tricks. We were eyewitnesses of what Jesus did. God in the flesh. So as we pick up this morning, we're going to be in verse 45, Mark chapter 6. Let me, let me pray for us, and we'll jump in. Father, we thank you so much for your word, that we can read about the miracles. We can read about the things that you did, and Jesus, you do calm the storms, and you, you silence the darkness. You put an end to sin. And so, God, as we get into Scripture, we ask that you would reveal your divinity to us this morning, that we would be in awe of who you are, and how gracious and loving, and compassionate, and forgiving you are to us. Father, we thank you for this time in Christ's name. Amen. 
First thing I want to show you is, we've said this before, power, prayer precedes power. Prayer precedes power. Mark chapter 6, starting verse 45. Immediately, he made his disciples get in the boat and go before him to the other side of Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up to the mountain to pray. Now, this is where we pick up. We pick up where we left off last week. He just fed the 5,000. Now he's put his disciples in the boat. And he's sending them on their way, and he's going to retreat off to the mountainside so he can pray. Now, this is one of three distinct times that Mark records Jesus praying. Number one was when he began his ministry in Mark chapter 135. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. The second place being this one in verse 46. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. The last one being very familiar in Mark chapter 14, verse 32. And they went to the place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. This is so important for us to recognize that Jesus made a practice of praying. He spent time with the Father in communion and prayer. So what can we learn from the example of Jesus? There's three things. Prayer is essential for personal discipleship. It's essential. You can't get around the fact that we need to be a praying people who are in constant contact with the Father. Pray without ceasing, right? We need to see the, how essential prayer is. If, if prayer was essential for Jesus, how much more essential is it for us? Prayer, number two, precedes power, not, necessar nece not necessarily prosperity. Now, that's difficult for us because when we pray, we want to see God do things, and we usually want to see him act on our benefit. Am I right? God, I'm praying. I want you to come and I want you to fix this. But as we see in the, in the final prayer that's recorded in Mark, it doesn't precede prosperity for Jesus. He still goes to the cross. And lastly, prayer moves the hand of God. Do you believe that? I mean, if you really think about that, that we have an opportunity to go to the Father and move the hand of God. If we really believe that, don't you think that we would see it as far more essential than we do? If we really believe that prayer moves the hand of God, don't you think that we would, we would be praying more often because we need to see the power of God in our life? We would see it as essential. D.L. Moody said it this way, every great movement of God can be traced to a kneeling figure. As I was reading this week and just personal study, I came across the story in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. This is Solomon, King Solomon. He's, he's dedicating the temple. And it says this, As soon as Solomon finished his what? Prayer. He prayed. Fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priest could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. Verse 3. When the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down. The people bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Do you see the prayer that's taking place? The power and the glory of God filling this place. And here's the verses that we know. Maybe we've quoted them before. If, verse 14. It's important right there, if. Because it's up to us. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then. This is an if-then statement, I will. Prayer precedes the power of God. If, then I will hear from heaven and, get, and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears, listen to this, attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. Do you believe that prayer moves the hand of God? Do you believe that prayer precedes the power and the presence and the glory of God? You see, sometimes we don't see the glory of God because we're not spending time on our knees in the presence of God. Church, I want you to hear that from a sincere heart this morning. That it's one of the most neglected things that we do as a disciple of Jesus Christ. We neglect to spend time in genuine prayer before the Lord because maybe we've got in our mind that 
Prayer doesn't move the hand of God. Maybe we've seen the world and, and, the, and the chaos that's going on and the things that are happening, and we've just sat back and been like, man, there's just no hope. But what if his people would humble themselves, repent of their sins, turn from the wicked ways, and cry out? Then his ear would be attentive. Prayer precedes power. You see, if we're missing out on the power of God, we have to ask ourselves, am I spending time on my knees before the glory of God? Do you ever feel that way, like there's just no power for your, your spiritual walk? You, you just feel drained, you feel tapped out, you feel, you feel weak, you feel helpless. Maybe sometimes you have to ask yourself, maybe I'm not seeing the power of God in my life because I'm not spending time before the presence of God on my knees. Personal discipleship begins with prayer. D.L. Moody, again, there are many of us that are willing to do great things for the Lord, but few of us are willing to do little things. You see, there's a lot of us that would say, oh, I'll, oh, count me in for that, Pastor. Oh, if our church does this, I want to be a part of that. Because when we do those things, we get to do a little bit of this, and we feel really good about our service, but there's not a lot of us who would do the little things that get no accolades. And one of the smallest, most powerful things that we could do as a church, as a body of Christ, is to spend time on our knees before the Lord. Humble. Humble. Without pride. Without arrogance. Without thinking we're better than other people because we don't respond in this world like people do. Oh, I'm above that. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And every single one of us have turned our back on him. We should be a people who humbly pray. You see, we can fool ourselves into believing that, we can believe the lie that we don't have time to be devoted to a Bible study. We can buy into that lie, oh, my week is just so jammed full, work's really hard right now, I've got a lot of things going on, I just don't have time to devote myself to a Bible study or to be devoted to a daily devotion. Oh, I just, in the mornings when I wake up, it's just chaotic, I just don't have time for that, and when, by the time I go to bed at night, I'm exhausted, I just don't have time for a daily devotion. And some of us can buy into the lie that we don't have time to be part of a a church family on a regular basis. But we can't afford to fool ourselves into believing that we don't need to spend time in prayer. We're called to pray. If Jesus prayed, we need to pray. If Jesus needed to pray, how much more do we need to pray? We need to pray, both individually and corporately, for the glory of God, the power of God, and the presence of God to fill this place. It would be my prayer that this would be a place of prayer. That this would be a place where the presence and the power of God are evident. That this would be a place that we don't go through routines, that we don't just sit in pews, and we don't just sing songs and then get up and go home, that we would be a people who gather because we are in desperate need for the hand of God to be moved in our life. We need to be a people who pray. Prayer precedes power in both personal discipleship and corporate relationships. So I'm going to pause. And this is going to be awkward, and I don't care. But I'm going to pray. And I invite you in your best effort of social distancing at the altar to pray with me. Maybe you can't make it down here. I encourage you to make your pew an altar. Because prayer moves the hand of God, and we desperately need the hand of God to be moved. I desperately want to see the glory of God. And to see the glory of God, I've got to spend time on my knees in the presence of God. Will you join me? Can we pray?
Gracious Heavenly Father, we bow before you humbly on our knees, longing for the glory of God and the presence of God to fill this place and not, not just this building, but your temple, us, that your spirit would reside in us and that you would give us power over sin. You would give us power over the wickedness. You would give us power to face the trials, the temptations, and the storms of life. That we would be dependent upon you. That we would be known as a people who follow hard after you. That long to be in your word. That long to hear your voice. Long to be in your presence. God, that your spirit would move. We ask God for revival. We ask that it would start with us individually. It would spread corporately and it would go into the community into the nation, into the world, that people would know you and they would see you for who you are and what you've done. Father, we humbly ask for forgiveness when we have sinned. You're a good and gracious God, and we thank you for your love, your kindness, and your mercy. God, we ask that you would rain down your presence upon us. In Christ's name, amen. All right, church, second point is this, presence precedes peace. Prayer, uh, power precedes, prayer precedes power and presence precedes peace. Picking up verse 47. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. This is such an interesting uh, dialogue that, that Peter gives us, that they're out at sea, they've been going against the waves and it's against them and they're struggling and Jesus saw it. He's still on the land and they're on the sea. John records the same story and he says it this way, the sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they're way out to sea. They rowed three or four miles. They saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat and they were frightened but he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. The question we have to ask ourselves is, why did Jesus put these men in the boat and send them off to sea without him? He put them in the boat, he sent them off, and he went off to the mountain to pray. And he saw that they were struggling, that they were having difficulty against the wind. So he chooses to walk to them. Paul in Romans in the New Living Translation, it ask a question. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? I like this. Does it mean that he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity? Or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? Does it mean that he doesn't love us anymore when we don't sense that he's in the boat? When we're struggling to make headway, does it mean that he's punishing us? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So why are there storms? Romans 8, and 24 says this, We know that the whole creation has been groaning with the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For this hope we were saved. But hope... That is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes in what he has already seen? This is what Paul is saying. Look, there's going to be times of trouble. There's going to be difficulties. You're going to be rowing hard against the wind and the waves. And storms will come because storms are a result of sin. Before sin entered the world, there were no hurricanes. There were no, there were no tornadoes ripping through the Garden of Eden. No, the world is groaning. 
we see that the world is groaning because of the injustice in our world. We see that the world is groaning because of the sin that is rampant in our world. And those of us who have been given the first fruits, that is the spirit of God, the power of God, the presence of God in our hearts, we too are groaning, longing for the day when he will make everything right. He hasn't forsaken us. He hasn't left us. And even though we feel like we're alone in the midst of a storm and we are, we are struggling to make headway, he knows exactly where we are. Storms come to all. He reigns on the just and the unjust. It says in verse 48, and he saw that they were making headway painfully for the wind was against them. You see, God knows the storm that you are facing. He sees you. He knows you. He loves you. And though troubles and trials and storms arise, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing. See, these storms, they are a result of sin, but they're still subject to the sovereignty of God. Storms may be a result of sin, but they're still subject to the sovereignty of God. Therefore, God can use them for a redemptive purpose. Jesus' redemptive work in the midst of the storm is to reveal himself more clearly to his disciples. This is going to be a defining moment in his relationship with his disciples. He sent them out into the sea on their own so that he could show up later and reveal himself in the darkest of night. You see, if it weren't for the storm, you may not see him as Savior. If you've never got to a point where you had to cry out for help, you may have known him as teacher or rabbi or Lord, but as Savior. Save me. I'm struggling. Verse 48, and he saw that they were making headway painfully. For the wind was against them, and about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass them by. What an interesting way of wording that. You know, when I was first reading this, I I had a vision of Jesus just walking on the water and kind of like, what's up, fellas? Struggling, I see that, and just keep on walking. You know, that that would be the kind of way that I would want to walk past him, like, I see you there, roughing, roughing it. Now, this is, this is speaking back to Exodus. This is speaking back to God revealing himself to Moses. This is speaking back to when he wants to pass by and show his glory. Look what it says in Exodus 33, 18 through 23. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I am gracious and I will be, show mercy to whom I show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face. For man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, he sought to pass by him. I will put you in the cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. He sought to pass by them. He sought to reveal himself as the glory of God. Jesus is the glory of God in the flesh, revealing himself to these men in the midst of a storm. You see, they've seen miracles, they've seen healings, they've seen demons cast out, but now they're seeing him as God in the flesh, walking on water. And he sought to pass by them. Guys, you're struggling. You're you're having a hard time making headway, but I'm going to pass by you so you, you see that I am God. God in the flesh. He walked perhaps several miles. Three to four miles is what John said. In pitch black darkness. Our Lord makes his way to those he calls, loves, and cares for. He knows where they are and what they're going through. I I don't know if it's true because I don't wake up that early. But I've heard that the darkest part of the night is right before the dawn. And this is exactly the time. The darkest moment in these men's lives. Physically, they're struggling. They're struggling to make headway. They've rode for hours and miles, and it's dark, and they feel like they have no hope. But it said Jesus saw them, and he came walking to them on the water. He knew exactly when to reveal himself. Jesus knows your storm. He knows exactly where you are and what you're going through, and he wants to reveal himself in his glory to you. So take heart. 
He cares enough to intercede for you in the midst of the storm long before he meets you physically. He has met you in prayer. So he went up to the mountainside and he prayed. He knows what they're going through. Look at what Romans says in Romans 8, 34. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. He's at the the seat of power. And what is he doing? He's interceding for us in our struggles. As we're struggling to make headway, he's interceding for us. Jesus doesn't condemn us if we are in him because he's covered us by his sacrifice. He would never say that his sacrifice wasn't sufficient for your sin. Now, I want you to get that. Who's there to condemn you? No one. Because Jesus is interceding for you, and he would never say that the sin that you're involved in or the struggle you're in is not enough for him to cover. That's an amazing, reassuring truth. So, even in the storms, he hasn't forsaken us, but he's interceding for us. Verse 50 says this, For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. This is so neat. The actual language language is, This is the I am. Not only is Jesus planning to pass by them to reveal his glory, he's going to do so by revealing his name. And he says, I am. I am the one who created all things. I am the one who's all powerful. I am the one who walks on waters, even in the midst of storms. And storms... Storms are opportunities for us to exercise faith and opportunities for Jesus to display his divinity and his deity. It's an opportunity for Jesus to show you who he really is. And it's an opportunity for you to exercise faith. This is what Matthew records. Now, what I think is interesting is that Peter doesn't record this. Peter, when he's given this account to Mark, he, he leaves this part out. He doesn't, I don't want any, any accolades for this. I, I'm just going to leave this part out, but Matthew says, and Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. So the water's still raging. And Peter decides to get out of the boat and decides to walk towards Jesus. And he begins to sink because men don't walk on water. And he says, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? He said little. He didn't say no, no faith. It's an opportunity to exercise your faith, even if it's a little. Even if it's a little faith. Storms give us an opportunity to exercise our faith. Why did you doubt? And when they got in the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. They saw him differently. Finally, the last thing we see in this section of Scripture is position precedes proclamation. After they've been through what they've been through, they have a new thing to say about Jesus. Surely you are the Son of God. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. What an interesting thing to record. Peter basically says, you know what? He revealed his glory He told us he's the I am. He walked on water. I even got out of the boat. And we didn't get it. We still missed it. But the position precedes proclamation. The storms you are in, or the storms you have gone through, have put you in a position to proclaim who Jesus is. You may not have got it. You may not even understand why the storm had to happen or why there was a storm, but it puts you in a position to proclaim who Jesus is. It allows you to proclaim, truly, he is the Son of God. You see, sometimes we just don't get it. We can be told something or shown something a dozen times and then forget what we learned. That was algebra for me, right? I was told a thousand times, you just do this. And I was like, oh, it seems so easy. What do we do? It's true of his his disciples. This wasn't their first storm. This wasn't their first eyewitness account of a miracle. Do you remember the first storm? They're in the storm. Jesus is asleep. He's got a little pillow, and they run down, and they say, don't you even care that we're dying? And he wakes up, and he calms the storm. This isn't the first time they've had this experience, but they forgot. 
But every time they find themselves in a situation, it's easy to think that this one's different and forget what God has done. Aren't we the same way every time we find ourselves in a storm, struggling to make headway, we think, well, this one's different. But God wants to reveal his glory. He is faithful. You see, we may never know why a storm had to happen, why we had to go through a situation, a hardship, or a sickness, but we can rest assured that God wants to reveal his deity to us in times of distress. And when he does that, our faith becomes a reality when Christ is revealed. You see, the, the thing about faith is we can exercise it after we've, when we're in the storm. Faith isn't something you're just told. Faith isn't something you're taught. Faith is something that's gifted to you by God. And when he gives you faith, when he gifts you faith, it becomes a reality when he is revealed. So maybe we should pray. Pray for the glory of God and the presence of God to fill our lives. Because we will face storms. We will face tough times, rough waters. And we need God to just reveal himself to us, to help us with our faith. John says this in verse 21. Then they were eager to let him in the boat, and immediately they arrived at their destination. Now that just floors me. They didn't do any more rowing. They didn't do any more, you know, battling. Just immediately they were there. For us, the destination is not a physical place on land. It's a spiritual position of faith that proclaims Jesus. And the truth is, you wouldn't be able to proclaim Jesus if it hadn't been the storms that you went through. For many believers, the faith journey takes them through storms for more powerful testimonies afterwards. If it hadn't been for the storm, we wouldn't have known Jesus as intimately as we do now. So here's my questions. What's your storm? Have you gone through a storm? Are you in a storm? How has Jesus revealed himself in the midst of that storm? And who needs to hear that testimony? And it's not a testimony. Let me clear this up. It's not a testimony of, look what I did. Look at how I got better. Look at how I defeated this. Look at how I followed this step process. Peter left out the whole part about walking on the water. Because it's all about Jesus. The testimony is, I was sinking. And I cried out, save me. And he did. Can I pray for us? Father, we thank you so much that when we cry out humbly for you to save us, you reach out your hand and pull us from the raging waters. The raging waters of sin and doubt, frustration. Father, we ask that as we become more a praying people, that you would meet us in, in, our, in the midst of prayer. That you would speak to us in times of trials and troubles. And God, that we would look to you to reveal yourself even in the darkest of nights and the roughest storms. Father, help us to respond with genuine worship. In Christ's name, amen. Will you stand? Will you respond? has a voice and it called my name and came before I called mercy was willing and it took my place and came before I called you came before I Only this Jesus is my testimony Every curse is in the grave My whole life has been redeemed Free from sin Jesus is my testimony 
love is the nails it's the crown of thorns for the cross has changed it all love like the world has never seen before for the cross has changed it all yes the cross has changed it all sin Jesus is my testimony Hallelujah Hallelujah He is risen let my song ever be hallelujah hallelujah it is finished this is my victory hallelujah hallelujah he is risen let my song ever be Hallelujah, hallelujah, it is finished, this is my victory, hallelujah, hallelujah, he is risen, let my song ever be. Hallelujah, it is finished, this is my victory, and from beginning to the end, and for all eternity, I will sing, Jesus is my testimony, I was lost, now I am found, I was blind, now all I see, only this Jesus is my testimony. Every curse is in the grave. My whole life has been redeemed. Free from sin, Jesus is my testimony. You're dismissed this morning. Thank you for being with us.